Well, hello there, YouTube, and welcome to another oil painting video. I'm going to title this series uh, Yupari's Art Studio Series. So, uh, one addition is that you have this camera. I don't know how um, I will do with the pressure of having this camera on me, but this is a pre recorded video, so I will be able to edit this or not even upload it if it goes terribly wrong. And the uh, idea is that I will be creating paintings for you to see uh, as videos to paint along with me. The photo reference is up there. It will also be linked in the description box of this video so you can uh, draw or paint along with me. This video will be in real time. The aim is to finish this painting all in one sitting and this painting will be available for sale and I will give you the um, cost of this painting at the end of this video but if you're curious about how much this painting is going to cost you can just easily scroll ahead and see that so the colors are listed for you in the description box of this video also information on the panel is also given in the description box of the video i have toned this panel ahead of time so this is a linen canvas that is stretched onto a wooden panel this is a Centurion brand. I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm not sure how you pronounce it still. Um, I'll show you the back side. It is an 8 by 10 inch uh, Centurion Universal Primed Linen Panel. But I like to um, prepare these panels ahead of time. Uh, any surface really, I like to tone ahead of time. So enough with the talking. Let's go ahead and start with the painting. So I'm going to mix up a drawing color. And I'm using Burnt Sienna Ultramarine Blue, a little bit of this uh, neutral gray or brownish gray, which is just a combination of all the colors that were on my palette when I scraped it off and cleaned it um, the last time, which was, what, this morning. So I'm thinning out the paint with a little bit of Gamsol, and we're going to plan out the composition first. So let's say my platform is going to be about here. And the main element of this composition is going to be the flower. So it's going to fit somewhere over there. Maybe that drawing color is a little bit too dark. Though the colors are listed in the description box of the video, I will um, narrate the colors that I'm using for you. And right now that was just a touch of lead white. The shadow, the cast shadow on the platform is another element that I need to consider in terms of the composition. Where exactly do I want this rose to fit? And I'm just going to use like a simple triangular shape. This is abstract at the moment, but it will be a representational painting. I'm going to try to draw uh, the least amount that I can because I do want to jump into color uh, much faster. Okay, so already I've made some decisions. I made the flower a little bit bigger, though I may cut into it. Uh, but that is the general vicinity of where I want it to go. This has a very interesting uh, composition because the main diagonal is up here, but there is a shadow uh, casted down here, which is another element of this composition. And then the leaves. I'm thinking of the leaves in terms of groups. So this is a grouping of uh, one, two, and three. And this is a grouping of two. At the moment, it's all very abstract. With this webcam, you'll also be able to see how I move about while I'm painting. Uh, you'll you'll see the uh, the pace, I guess. You, you can tell that I'm not like right on the image. And then the all important little tiny jar. Is very small 
relative to the flower. And I guess about that is good. Now I'm gonna take a step back, meaning I'm just sitting back and I'm trying to I know as I move further back, my microphone is actually over here. So um you may not be able to hear me as clearly. Uh, but I'm just kind of getting an idea for the composition. Uh, things need to balance each other out. So there's a cast shadow over here on the reference that you can see right there. Um, that doesn't quite work, I think, with the design. I like this dark shape with this leaf. I think it really draws the eye towards the flower. And uh, enough said. I think that is a good enough drawing. More than good enough. And I'm going to just mix right into this. I'm using dioxazine purple and titanium white. I'm going to brown this purple out slightly. This is a Princeton Catalyst Polytip Bristle. This brush itself is one of the, I guess, one of the first brushes I might have used in this YouTube channel like five years ago. Okay, and I'm just going to test. Uh, and I think it should get a little more blue. So I'm going to use some cerulean blue. Now I'm going to thin the paint out with a little bit of Neo Magilp. It is off camera, um, but this is the Neo Magilp, the medium that I'm using. I had, I had to buy a new one, actually. I had nearly used up... Uh, this one over here, but I, I didn't actually use the new one yet. Um, I don't go through, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't go through a medium that quickly. I don't use enough of it to go through it. Now I'm going to sit back and ask myself if that is the color that I want. I don't want it to be too, like, obvious, like Barney Brown, like, uh, perfect brown. Some of you may not remember the reference I'm talking about. Um, an old kid's cartoon that apparently I used to watch when I was a child back in the 90s. Barney the Dinosaur. That's good. That's purple, but it's not like uh, obvious purple. And I'm going to surround the flower with it first because I'm going to have to keep recharging this color. Okay, now I'm starting to shape the flower. I'm considering the leaf that is right there. Uh, completing a painting all in one sitting is not impossible. It's difficult, it's very difficult, and it takes many years of practice. Um, but I will be guiding you through all of it. Everything. Nothing here is edited. And I like to have the panels toned a neutral gray value. Uh, because I'm usually painting things that are warm, like like skin tones tend to be really warm. So I paint the skin tones warm over a cool background. But this is kind of perfectly in the middle, uh, so it works for many things. And we might even have enough, we might have mixed up enough paint that we can just cover all of this. And you're just getting a feel for the composition at this point. Just like I'm, I'm getting a feel for talking to a webcam, uh, which I'm, I'm not used to. And we did. We mixed up enough paint. Somehow, first try, we mixed up enough paint. Now the next thing that I want to consider compositionally is um, the cast shadow um, from the glass. Now. I just noticed that this cast shadow here is actually edited by 
or it is affected by the shadow on the platform that's like right there so um i'm gonna have to edit how i paint it because i'm going to push this shadow because i think that the light and dark pattern actually works pretty well with this uh, overall design and the cast shadow i'm gonna push it a touch towards the cooler end of the spectrum remember that my colors are uh, lined up like this on purpose it is a color wheel it's lined up like a color wheel now i'm going to use lead white i do have two whites on here i have lead white up there and then i have titanium white down there lead white has this property of which allows you to use more of it without raising the value uh, too much which allows you to have more control over the mid-tone range also it allows you to have a thicker consistency of paint which some of you may like. Lead white is not going to harm you if you keep it off your hands. And for those of you that are interested in owning these paintings in the future, um, because I am going to keep the prices very reasonable so that uh, you know, like gas prices and everything are raising, but the prices of my paintings are dropping. Uh, so go figure. Uh, but anyway, uh, it is not dangerous to own a painting that is created with uh, lead white uh, because you're not going to eat this painting I, I hope you're not going to eat it um, you're not going to scrape it uh, you're not going to do anything that's going to release any of the lead uh, if you think about it there's way more uh, dangerous things that you can own like a car uh, that can that can go wrong now I'm thinking of light and dark patterns I really enjoy how this complements this and the next thing that's going to be fun is to put in the dark for the uh, leaves i'm using sap green i usually use viridian uh, but i ran out of viridian just about ran out of it um, viridian is a very expensive color so i'm gonna go through my sap green just like i'm doing with my red uh, that's supposed to be cadmium red but it is winter red because i want to use it up Sap green is ideal uh, for making something green, um, but not a blue green, which is what viridian is. But uh, if I want to get something similar to a viridian with sap green, I, I have to add a little bit of ultramarine blue to it. So it becomes viridian-like. Now, it's going to be important to use the tone of the canvas wherever possible. But right now, I don't think I need to utilize it very much. So, that was a mistake. I do need to utilize it because the less pressure I put there, uh, the less dark this looks. Though it, I have it reversed, this should be lighter and this should be darker. I think it works in an abstract sense. And yes, I am changing the size of the leaves. All of this is being doctored basically so that it fits with the design. And uh, you should be considering both the composition of your painting and the uh, likeness to your model. Even though this is not a human, uh, I still consider likeness. Okay, so a little bit of a shadow there, and I think we're good to go with that dark. This leaf looks like it's half alive, so I'm just going to paint it like such meaning that I'm angling it down. I'm gonna lighten it now with a color change and I'm using cadmium green. By the way, um, since I'm trying to save on my materials more, um, what I did was I 
Again, I, I switched my palettes. I love using the wooden palette. That's my favorite palette to use after all, but um, most of you prefer this setup where you have the glass that's gray, so you can see in the same light the colors. Like I understand that, but another benefit to this is just like I used to back in the old days, um, just put this in the freezer and it keeps the paints pretty nicely. The only one that doesn't really keep is uh, lead white. That that right there, uh, not lead white, um, uh, lead tin yellow. That one right there tries to dry, uh, even in the freezer. Okay, so there is some light on the leaves. And I think now is a, is a good time to put them in. So I'm gonna have to change brushes for this and just like I put the palette in the freezer, I also put the paints in the freezer. Um, I utilize the freezer for a lot of stuff. Uh, I have a different freezer for food, of course. Um, though you could you could put this in your freezer with your food. It's 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 not like any of the materials are just going to like magically walk their way over uh, into your into your ribeye steaks or your. Um, your your chocolate ice cream, Rocky Road ice cream, or whatever. Get your ice cream will be fine. And let's add a touch of Viridian to this. And let's start to put in, actually, you know what? Hold on a sec. We need a dark before we add a light. Once again, I do enjoy that uh, in an abstract sense. I'm talking about the abstract a lot. Light and shadow is absolutely critical. Because that's what makes form makes a form look three-dimensional and when you're aiming to finish a painting in one sitting you have to be strategic you have to make every brush stroke count as a result the video should be it should seem at least a little more I guess um, fast paced. This is just seltzer water. All right, so the next dark to consider is going to be the the platform and the value of the platform relative to the um, to the shadows is going to be important. And I'm going to use the same brush again because it's a pretty good brush to use for the darks. Color-wise, I think it should be, um, it's similar to this light uh, on the reference. So I think it should be, if this is cooler, this is going to become warmer, and then this is going to become cooler. So cooler, warmer, cooler. All right, so let's, hold on. Okay, warmer. I got to remember what I just said. So we're going to use red. This is the Windsor red. This is going to make a brown. Mixing this in here, I use titanium white because it is uh, it has higher tinting strength and it's cooler. Now you can notice how far back I'm sitting when I'm doing this. 
a little bit of Mio on my guilt. And just testing. That, uh, it might be a tad bit dark. And titanium white, I should have used lead white. Titanium white is very tricky because it can get too light very easily. Uh, but I think that's good. And this is going to be a good color to relate to the flower. Again, this composition is very tricky. I don't want this shadow to meet on that edge, so I'm going to edit it. Composition is everything. I'm putting some of the paint over here so that when we get to the glass, uh, it will look more glass-like. The pressure is on. Uh, We've got to make a living, so we've got to be able to make this painting in a reasonable amount of time and sell it. Okay, so now we can go and draw the cast shadow. So I'm always doing many steps at once. I'm also adding the contour and the edge quality of the cast shadow that essentially will finish the cast shadow once i get the penumbra of the cast shadow the penumbra of a shadow is this so if you see the cast shadow on the canvas you see that the edge of the shadow is sharper right there and it gets softer as it goes away. It becomes more diffuse. So we need to sharpen this edge there and let that one get softer. Okay, so now we have painted the platform. That part is done. All right, so the next notable dark to consider is going to be the shadow on the rose, and that's not something I want to do with that brush because I need to change brushes for a dramatic color change like that one. I recommend you always have about, I don't know, like five brushes uh, that you can move around. Don't just try to do this all with one brush because it's annoying to have to clean it. And yes, I am cleaning this brush because I took it out the freezer. I didn't clean it. I used it yesterday. I didn't clean it. Put it in the freezer. The brush will be fine. I will be able to uh, bring it back to um, being fully clean uh, without too much effort, I hope. All right, so the next step is going to be um, figuring out what I want this color to be in relation to the surrounding colors. Now, this one is going to be warmer. This one is going to be cooler. This shadow is going to be cooler. It's also going to be cooler relative to, to this. So maybe it would be uh, advantageous for me to consider what this warm color is going to be relative to the light of the rose um, because it, it's its own thing that pink uh, area is not really you can't compare it to everything else because there's nothing else around it that's that pink so i'm going to say um looking at the reference the reference has got it a little bit not naturalistic uh the reference makes the, the rose Look almost, uh, look almost washed out. 
where in fact um just through uh physics things that are facing the light more should actually have more of that chroma so i'm going to make the lights more saturated the shadows less saturated but what about the color uh i think i want it to go more towards the grayish violet pink a grayish violet pink and then this will just be bright pink uh as, as bright pink as i can get it so i can get it to glow um and uh let's let's mix that neutral grayish um whatever i just said with the cast shadow so i'm using a alizarin and not the cast shadow the form shadow i'm using alizarin cerulean blue ultramarine blue i'm hesitant to brown it yet i want a very specific purple lead white now the shadow is is uh, going to be lighter than this. That's important. And it's a good thing, I guess, that I have this palette set up because looking at this, that's like this value and I don't want that. So let's use some titanium white. Now you see it's lighter, but it's it might be what I want. I don't know. Maybe a tad bit cooler. So, cerulean blue. And I hope you're enjoying the webcam. Um, to some of you, it may be a distraction. Um, but I, I want to add more of a human element to to these videos. I'm, I, I told you I admit I'm scared to do it, but... I'm not as afraid anymore. I guess the nerves calm down after enough time. Also, it's not live, so it's not a live stream. So I'm not that nervous. Okay. Uh, that looks good, but we won't really know until we put it there. And that's good. That's the shadow that I want. And roses, you have to draw them with the same... Uh, uh, intricacy that you would uh, face meaning very specific light and shadow the good news is that you don't have to worry about likeness that much you just have to worry about precision specificity you want your shapes to be very clean all right Not bad, not bad at all. Goodness gracious, I think we almost got a painting that someone out there is going to want to buy. How's that for real world uh, application to uh, to painting? Not just your standard tutorial anymore. Let's see if you probably can sell this thing. Uh, so that that's a fun part about this. Okay, all right, so now that we have the shadow in check uh the next thing that we want to do before we go and put that bright pink is consider again i'm thinking of everything in this composition uh almost simultaneously the next thing is going to be how is this light going to relate to these lights and I, I i'm i'm playing with the idea in my mind of throwing in some bright turquoise highlights there uh, but before we get into that, we need to cover this now because this value needs to be darker relative to this value. Right now, there's the same. I don't want to just go and throw the bright pink in there, even though I probably could. Uh, we're going to play it safe here with the composition. So um, I said that this was going to be warmer and this is going to be cooler. But this also has to be a specific value relative to this and it is going to be a lighter value relative to this but it's also going to be a darker value relative to that so you see that we are um, controlling the value range and the color as with as much precision as we can so we're going to go with titanium white and i'm going to utilize this puddle here 
because I did say I wanted this to be something relative to this. So ultramarine blue. And in order to make it a little less uh, of a standard looking color, um, I'm going to use this puddle over there. And we're going to try this out. That's pretty good. That's um, close to the color that I want. Um, but it's too dark. Uh, so let's add lead white. A little bit of medium. I'm also looking at the painting on the computer. That's why you see me turn my head over here. Because I am looking at the uh, the footage as I'm, I'm filming this. Alright, so it is now cooler relative to this, but not by much. I don't want it to be like blue, pink, red. Uh, they've got to be very precise colors. So that looks good. That looks good to me. And this value is going to allow me to do multiple things at once, just like I did down there i'm going to be able to control the edge quality of everything here and the shape of everything there and i'm going to be able to add some more of that transparency effect to this uh, still life object so a lot of stuff i'm able to control a lot of stuff with this but sometimes being able to wield uh, this much power is not Good for everyone. All right, that appears to be pretty much the edge quality on the reference. I'm going to revisit that later, but I don't think I want that edge to be that sharp. You have to consider the sharp edges and the softer ones. This one right here, I want to pull attention towards it, so I'm going to make it sharper. That one, I want to pull attention away from it, so I'm going to make it softer. And I'm filming these videos a little bit out of order because these are pre-recorded videos so I, I really at this point as you're watching this I can't know which video I uploaded earlier but just know that I'm uh, I'm filming I just um, don't really have an exact order of these Now one thing uh, to think about is, do I want this straight line to be razor sharp, not razor sharp, um, like T-square straight? And I don't think so. I want there to be some irregularity to this line. And I'm going to almost make this line disappear because I'm going to paint into it. And now I can draw the uh, perimeter of this glass object with much more precision than I uh, would have been able to earlier uh, because I was doing so many things at once. That looks pretty good. I don't know. Sometimes things just work. Um, that looks good to me. Remember now, the camera is at an angle with respect to the painting, so um, things are going to look a little different relative to you. I will, of course, um, move the painting so you can see it upright um, facing you. 
especially for anyone that's interested in owning this painting. But I'm taking all of you along for the ride. This real world stuff. All right, that's a very careful um, edge. Very careful. That is almost this value, but it is a little, a uh, little bit uh, lighter. Real world stuff met with real world precision. This will go here. Now we're going to make the glass look like glass uh, eventually. This edge. And I'm going to just push it a little bit lighter just for the sake of clarity. And this one's going to be sharper, but that one's going to be a little bit softer. We're constantly thinking about the design of this. Okay, so here is where I'm going to revisit the idea of that edge. And I do like the sharpness of it, but um, when I blur my eyes, I feel like there is a little too much of light and then dark. Um, I'm thinking that I need to blur this, and then I'm going to add a little air of um, maybe something lighter and a little more blue uh, to that. And I need to move my glasses down, which is important for you to see. Um, because I blur my eyes in order to see less detail and just get an idea of the big picture. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little bit of thalo turquoise which is a very powerful color and um daxazine purple all right so this part's going to be tricky because i'm going to be mixing uh directly onto this color and i'm going to start around the flower so this is going to give the flower a little bit of a glow effect when we paint in the uh, blue, not the blue, the, the pink. Now remember, I wanted to make this uh, lighter relative to that, so I don't have a lot of room. I don't have a lot of margin for uh, for error here. So I'm adding this directly onto the paint. And you see I'm leaving some of it there to be darker so that we have that contrast that I wanted. But this is now creating a nice um, fade. It's quieting down this shape.
Okay, so that adds a little more dimension. Now it's not so much just a dark purple shape there. Now there's a, a little uh, glow to it. Now the all important pink. And I have a very special uh, weapon for this. Uh, is a uh, perylene red I like to use for uh, bright pinks so I'm gonna have to look for it in my paint stuff all right I found it so a little bit of uh, background information about perylene red perylene red is made from gamblin it is a fiery red so it's like a red that leans towards the yellow um, and it is kind of perfectly in the middle between alizarin crimson and cadmium red or in this case of course um what do you want to call it uh winter red so i'm not going to mix it with the palette this the mixing space this small i'm gonna have to take this out of here we're gonna have to test out this pink. This is why I recommend you use a larger palette so you don't have to do this. I'll leave some of that color there just for future reference. I'm not gonna just throw all this paint away. I'm just gonna put it down there. Yes, I, I know I could just use a razor blade to get, clean this, but even with the razor blade, I still have some remnants of paint left. So I'd rather just use the paper towel. All right, so we've got to figure this out. Um, let's use a little bit of in red, a lot. Of titanium white. Now look at that. That's that's fire. Fiery red. But like I said, I'm gonna try one where there's a lot of titanium white, and then I'm gonna try one where there is not so much. All right, so that is the pink with a ton of titanium white. Let's try it without so much. And it's a tough call, uh, I don't know. I do like how bright that is um, on your computer screen or your iPhone screen or or Android phone screen or, or whatever. Uh, it's going to look a little different. Um, whew, this is a tough call. I think I'm going to go for this one. Um, so let's just add a little more paint to it. Right, I'm gonna go for this one. A little bit of color information. You cannot make a red brighter by adding, uh, or more saturated, excuse me, by adding uh, only white to it, uh, because that will make it pink. But obviously we want pink, so that's not bad. Um, but what we want is uh, a yellowish red in the light because uh, 
if you add yellow to red, it'll actually look like a brighter, more saturated red than a colder one, less saturated one, if you add too much white. Which is why I like Paraline Red, because it has some uh, yellow built into it. So we're going to add the pink with the palette knife. So we have the purest color possible. Of course, I'm not adding too much. Now, as I'm adding this, I'm thinking the value may be a little too dark. But it's also my thought process relative to the photo reference. I can't let the photo reference determine everything. I have to stand back or sit back, I guess. Now, relative to my computer screen, I'm really having doubts uh, with this color. And mainly for the value. So what I think I'm going to do is, with a smaller brush, I'm going to add more paint into it. Uh, and I'm going to add straight lead tin yellow. Now this is a sable brush. I guess I am going to trust the photo reference after all. Now lead tin yellow is a very beautiful classical color. It has some hints of a uh, of a uh, blue in it, which I kind of want to complement the fiery red. And I'm letting wet paint mix into wet paint because it will allow me to have a little more control of the edges. Sitting back. Okay. So you got to stand back or sit back. Notice how far away I appear to be relative to the painting. All right, so now what I'm going to do is add some touches of uh, dark. And the touches of dark are going to have to be added with a deep red that is very transparent and has moderate tinting strength, not too high uh, tinting strength. So what color do you think that I would use uh, for that? What do you think comes to mind um, with a dark red? as transparent with moderate tinting strength. Some of you may be thinking a lizard and crimson. So if you're thinking a lizard and crimson, that is correct. This is actually a lizard and permanent, uh, but it, it's the same. 
for me, it basically is the same. Now the all-important dark accents. Because you can't have light without dark. Especially the dark accents, they're very critical in creating the illusion of form. And I should have changed brushes, I don't know why I didn't, but... Oh well, I could have also just used the Paraline Red. Some of you may have been thinking of that one. But it's just a little too light. Now I'm going to push the form relative to the original. Now from a distance, this is going to have that look of a bright flower, but when you get close to it, it's going to look very abstract. The only way that you can get that, that look, that effect, is by uh, painting from a distance. Um, so if I just move my camera, uh, you can see just like how far back I am. So what you have uh, is the, the hints of this bright pink behind, uh, underneath of the lead tin yellow, and you have these dark uh, accents that are being added uh, with the alizarin crimson. And you have that comparison of the this shadow relative to that. I gotta say I'm really happy with this this rose. The color range is working in my favor. It's starting to get a glow effect. Gotta know your colors really well. Gotta know how they behave. And this is the part where uh, this is similar to a portrait painting. This is the precision part. I'm squinting, but I'm actually looking at the at the laptop.
So I'm inventing some stuff a little bit now. And we're we're making pretty good um, progress with this. It's been less than an hour still. So why do I like to use sables uh, for this precision stuff? I like sables because they um they're soft and sometimes it's actually easier um you saw the transition actually i went in there with palette knife and then sable so uh, when you paint with thicker paint with uh well if you have a lot of thick paint and then you use a thin brush sometimes like this you can make the paint the brush stroke actually have some elements of the um the under the layer underneath and if I zoom you in which you'll be surprised at how abstract it is uh, you can see that there are some little strands uh, it's almost like those stringy like effects of um, the, the pink uh, infused with the uh, with the lead tin yellow So this is just uh, drawing stuff now. And at this point, it's a lot of intuition. I'm just, I'm just going for it. I'm going for the uh, the right color, the right value, the right shape. And I'm at the stage where I don't know where uh, everything is going to fit exactly. I'm just using intuition now. I'm even going to add a touch of blue. So off camera, I'm using ultramarine blue and white into the shadow. So you see me blurring my eyes again. When I blur my eyes, I see exactly what I want on the computer screen and on the original, of course. But I'm very careful with the computer screen, uh, with the way it looks. This is, of course, a very standard size. 
So framing this will not be uh, very difficult. The frame won't be very expensive either. It will be an excellent painting to add to your collection or begin your collection. And the best part is, uh, you'll always have this video to show your family and friends uh, exactly how this painting was made, who made this painting. You can even see the face of the creator of this painting. Because you can't really separate the painter from the painting if you are considering you know, owning a work of art. There we go. Now we've got the light that I want. And from a distance, you see, I'm kind of turning my head as I look at it. I'm going to actually stand up. Now it's got an unreal glow to it. Um, which is, of course, a very realistic, naturalistic effect, but it was obtained through a lot of work, uh, careful observation with the colors. That last brush stroke um, finished the rose because it broke off this dark line that was there. And sometimes when you have just like one sweeping line across through a rose, it's a little not so naturalistic. Uh, and if you render out every flower petal on a rose, it's also just aesthetically it's kind of overkill if you go and you detail every little flower petal you might like how paintings like that look but it loses a little bit of that painter painterly quality that most of us like to see in flowers all right so next thing is going to be the stem and i told you that i covered a little bit more of it on purpose uh, so that I can I can do this, but I think I still have this color. Uh, do I? I think I do. I don't know. I'm just gonna blur it out a little more. No, I don't have this color. So I gotta be careful with that. See, smart. That's why I saved this little puddle there. Fixing my mistakes. Gotta blur that out. There we go. I uh, just gotta be careful with that. Next, the stem of the flower. It's gonna be dark and it's gonna fit really nicely with this composition because without it, it's just gonna be some floating things in the air. So, axazine purple. And it's complement yellow. I'm using Indian yellow. Burnt sienna. So I can get a nice and rich dark brown. I'm going to add some medium to it to thin it out. Now, if you're doing an ala prima like this, wet into wet, uh, wet, thinner paint tends to stick onto thicker paint much more, with much more ease. So well, now we're going to, before we go and put that in there, we're going to test it. And I think it's a touch too warm. So I'm going to go with sap green. So now it's a little bit warmer of a brown. It's also darker. Okay, that's the color I want. So I'm going to go with dark first, and then I'll add the light to the stem afterwards.
Or not. I don't know. I, I kind of like the flatness of it. Aesthetically. I'm going to stick with that. I like the flatness of that. It looks more believable to me. Next, um, the uh, glass. Alright, so we're going to start off with some of the dark details. And now I need to uh, clean up the mixing space again. I'm going to leave that pink though. And we're just going to mix all of this together. This is going to be my... Um, I don't want to call it scrap, so this is just going to be my leftover. Okay, so what do you say we mix with a bristle first? So I'm looking for the value of these dark accents. Let's use the perylene red. And ultramarine blue. A little bit of cerulean blue for a lighter blue. And this has to be a specific color relative to the green of the, um, the flower petals. And that is pretty much like Viridian blue-green. And uh, I think rather than green, I'm going to gray it. So I'm going to use the purple to gray it. That looks better to me. And there's a feeling of uh, immediacy and and uh, life, basically, that these paintings have. You, you can't get with a painting that you spend many days, months, weeks. And as I add brush strokes in this horizontal direction, it will create a glare that I'm going to have to adjust later. It was a little more strategic to paint the stem first and then paint this over the stem because the glass does distort the way the stem looks. You see that? So that's something that I wanted to, to do. Let's There's a dark triangle there, if you see that uh, in the reference. I kind of like the way that looks, but I don't know if I want to put that in because I know where this is coming from. This dark rectangle there. It's coming from the shadow being casted here, and remember we eliminated that. Um, so compositionally that may not work. I don't think we should put that in. We're not going to put that in right now. It's really simple to make glass look like glass. Put the environment behind it, make sure that it has 
the uh, surrounding dark like this and then throw on some highlights and you've got glass but again it takes years of precision to be able to do it just right years of practice to be able to do it just right or having the right guidance the right teacher Now we're going to mix up those bright highlights and this is going to be another nice and rich color that should fit somewhere right over there on this little teeny tiny palette. So I'm going to use Thalo Turquoise and White, Titanium White. That's going to be a really nice contrast. There we go. That's the highlight that we want. Now I'm going to clean off the sable. I'm not going to apply the highlight with the palette knife because it's going to be too thick. It's going to be kind of cheap. If you add uh, your highlights, a ton of impasto on your highlights, that looks good sometimes, but it's a little cheap to do it everywhere. We added the um, thickness of the light there. So it would be uh, too cheap to add it here too. It would look too much like, um, I don't know. It just wouldn't look right. Oops. All right, so now I need a place to rest my pinky. These highlights are very important and there's wet paint everywhere. So this is a uh, selfie stick. Let's see if you can see it. A selfie stick that I put a little um, the cloth on the front and um, it's just nice to be able to travel around with it when I'm painting. Um, this is a mall stick. All right, so where do these highlights go? Got to be one there. Two little ones there. There. Like, just like magic, it's going to start to look like glass. And we don't want the highlights to be the same exact color, so I'm going to go back to the highlights after doing, after applying them, and then I'm going to edit them. And then that'll be it uh, for this painting. I'll Find it after that. Okay, so rather than putting the highlight there, I like when glass objects have just a little trace of light on the bottom there, so I'm going to do that instead. And then of course we need some little light in the middle. make this look like there's actually something there and just like magic this starts to look like glass 
Now to change up the colors of the highlights, I'm going to go first and add a more blue area to the edge of this highlight. And what that does is that adds a very saturated thing in the light as it should be uh, because the brightest things uh, the most saturated things should be in the light not in the shadow though um there's some uh th there's always a counter examples for that but just adding a little touch of um saturation there i think will help to contrast that um the contrast of the blue there so we have a nice range of chroma um, but which highlights do I want to change their color? I think just this one, just this one, and that should be it. Uh, I think lead tin yellow and cadmium green. Let's mix it over here. Accidentally added a touch of lead white to it, but that's okay. All right, so now uh, is the stage where I'm going to adjust anything that I think needs to be adjusted. One thing is that this is too stringy of a highlight, not very believable. And there's a little something here. And you can still see some of the original drawing lines in there, which is something that I would like. I'm going to leave that there. Now we're going to... All right, now I'm going to stand up. I have to look at this from a distance. And shout out to those of you that use wooden palettes. This is absolutely my favorite. Uh, but, of course, I can't use it because you wouldn't be able to see what I'm doing. All right, that's it. So we are just going to sign it. I don't see anything else that I would want to do differently. So we're gonna just sign it now. And I wanna sign it on the top left. I'm gonna use a sable brush to sign it. Axazine purple, just, let's just mix right in the middle. Added uh, the perylene red, like all of it. Neo Magilp, a generous amount of it. Like I said, this is not edited, but you're going to see every part of it, even the signing. And I'll zoom you in so you can see it. You see how the thin paint sticks onto the thicker paint?
And yes, even the signing is a compositional decision. I signed it this way with uh, uh, this much larger because I wanted it to fit this composition. Because when, when you own this painting, when someone owns this painting, uh, you want it to be very clear to somebody that walks in the house, uh, this is an original painting. Uh, this is not a print. This is not a photograph of a painting. This is original. So this means that you have something that is of value. Every time that you own, uh, every time that you buy a, uh, a painting that was uh, painted by uh, an artist that you follow, it is very important to have that kind of connection. So I think that, that um, it fits the design because it goes like this and over there. So it fits this kind of diagonal um, in that there's a line that goes this way, the signature is there, and everything just kind of fits. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this around so you can see it without the distortion. Okay, uh, there it is. So you can see it now without the um, the distortion. So once again, this painting will be available for sale. Uh, so by the time that you're watching this, all you have to do is click uh, the link in the description box of this video uh, that says uh, uh, purchase this painting here, and then it's going to take you. It's going to redirect you to where you can buy this painting. So the all important thing. If you're interested in buying this painting, this is going to be in the series of paintings that I'm doing um, titled Yupari's Art Studio Series. This is what these videos are going to be. Um, I'm going to organize them in that way. A funny, uh, not funny, but uh, a fun thing about Yupari's Art Studio Series is that the acronym spells YES. YES. That's what it spells. Pretty fun. Uh, so. Uh, how much is this painting going to uh, sell for if you're interested? Uh, this painting will be available for sale at the price of $249.99. $249.99. Yes, I have lowered my prices. I know gas prices are rising. Everything is so much more expensive, but I have lowered the price of my paintings. Why is that? It's a supply and demand kind of thing. Um, so just economics that's why i'm lowering the price of my paintings so if you're interested in starting your art collection or adding this one to your art collection please check out the link in the description box of this video so that you can own this painting i will also paint uh, many more paintings uh, in this same style uh, with the exact same uh, purpose in mind so hopefully you found this video to be uh, fun, educational, insightful, uh, in, in some way. Remember, if you want to take your online art education with me further, starting at just $10 a month, please check out my online classes on patreon.com slash upariartist, also listed in the description box of this video. The $10 a month allows you to get uh, feedback from me on a weekly basis on your ongoing artworks, and of course access to all the pre-recorded videos uh, and all of the playlists for each project. So you've got a playlist per project so that you can watch the videos in order of each project uh, in the online classes. We've got more than 100 easily uh, lessons already in the online classes. And then moving up from the $10 a month, you also have uh, the live stream tier in, where, in which you can watch the uh, lessons streamed live. And you also have access um, to... Uh, well, basically, that's it. That's, you have the live streams. You have access to everything before that. And there's the Zoom uh, tutoring tiers. So um, at the $40 a month, you have uh, the ability to paint with me on Zoom Tuesdays and Fridays. Uh, and then there's another tier above from that, but that one has uh, the maximum number of students at the moment. Uh, but definitely check out the link in the description box for all of that information. Hopefully uh, this webcam thing wasn't too weird. Um, it took a little getting used to for me to actually talk to it. But it doesn't feel that uh, uh, different anymore. So 
hopefully again you enjoyed this video thank you so much for watching uh, if you're not subscribed to my youtube channel please consider subscribing to my youtube channel i wish you the very best in all of your artwork and i will see you on the next one